There we go. Great. So again, thank you all for coming um, and joining us this evening. It is a real pleasure to invite um, Dr. Dima Mahmoud, who it's my first time meeting you today, Dima, but I must say that um, your energy, positivity and liveliness on email is unparalleled. So thank you for that. It's been a real treat to arrange things with you in the last couple of weeks, like this little ray of sunshine. Um, so that's been great. Uh, apart from that, Dima has one of the, the most, I think, inspiring bios that I've seen. Um, I'll read to you just a little bit from it and then I'll hand over. I'll stop talking, I promise. Um, Dima is a humanist by practice, an activist by choice, and a passionate change maker by learning. She does everything she knows how to do to make this world a more balanced place and stops at nothing for truth, justice, and love. Dima facilitates order by manipulating chaos, which sounds wonderful, and excels at co-creating grassroots sustainable solutions by animating her knowledge, skills, and expertise to build alliances for inclusive collective growth. Dima has a PhD here from Exeter in Sudanese foreign policy and international legitimacy. Um, she is deeply invested in all matters linked to the liberation and advancement of people of African ancestry and is a co-founder of the Nubia Initiative um, and, and birthed the Africa Week 2020. Um, I guess it's a festival. Um, so I will let Dima take over from me um, and just uh, another round of thanks um, before we start and over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this introduction. I, so Jad, it looked like you were ready, but she said Dima take over. Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. But I, I was, I, thought, <laughs> I just thought I'd kind of set you up with the first question. You, but, uh, you can do that. I just want to make a quick comment about the sunshine and the, the Yes, the, of course, please go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you so much for that comment. My name actually means the cloud that carries the first drop of rain, which normally means dark and ominous. So thank you for bringing that light. And thank you so much for, for creating and co-creating this space uh, for me to at least virtually touch down in Exeter since I couldn't physically do it this year. Yes, uh, so I was just going to say it's, it's a real pleasure um, hosting you in this way. And, um, and also that, um, you know, we, we, we're trying to put together a series of anti-racism events, which of course will be primarily online this year. And um, increasingly, I'm realizing that we can probably do all of these just with our alumni, uh, which I think is a great thing, which uh, actually speaks volumes, uh, you know, about what the Institute is and has been uh, for a number of years. Um, so it definitely is, is great in that way. Um, so starting with that, I guess my, my first kind of setup question for you, Tima, is um, if you could tell us a bit kind of about yourself, you know, how you got to the Institute, your time at the Institute. And um, um, as I think you mentioned to me, you entered as one thing and left as another. So maybe you could tell us a bit about the journey at the Institute. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sajad. Um, and thank you so much for, for reaching out. I, I, I can't um, explain my, my face when I saw that message. It was like, wait, what? <laughs> yes. Um, so I'm, I'm very pleased, very happy, very humbled and honored to, to be here to share this journey and to share how Exeter and specifically my time at the Institute has entirely um, changed my trajectory. And yes, I, I came to Exeter <coughs> as an Arab <laughs> to study Sudan and Sudanese politics, though the goal was um, at the time to be able to contribute to the Palestinian cause. So a little bit of background, I am Nubian, uh, Sudanese origin, but I grew up in Egypt. And I wanted nothing to do with politics. Nothing, nothing. I wanted to be a filmmaker. I'll probably be making some good money by now. My mom wouldn't have it. I love you, mom, if you're watching this, even if you're not. Um, so no, mom had the vision that I'll be a diplomat. She sees me in politics, she sees me in politics, she sees me in politics. So I got into politics in Towson University where I did my undergrad and that's in Maryland in the US. And somehow there, and I wanted to, to go to England altogether to study um, 
to go for university because I was the British system in Egypt. Um, but I was too young, according to my mom, and she wouldn't have me go to the UK on my own. So I went to the US, uh, ended up doing politics. And at the time it was um, with the second Intifada, there was no way to escape what was going on in Palestine. And the Department of Politics in my university didn't have Middle East policy studies. And so I had to find a way to squeeze in the Middle East, to squeeze in Palestine in anything, in any course that I could, whether it was human rights, international law, you name it. I, 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 was, I, I took my own way in it. And upon graduation, um, I had to stay around and there was someone recruiting from Exeter in my university at Towson University, which was really interesting because also at the time I was exploring a sistership in, um, program between Exeter and my university, which had gone on pause. As soon as I decided I want to explore it, everything stopped and I was like, go figure. Okay, so I guess that's not the route we're taking. But then I end up meeting the recruiter and saying, oh, why don't you consider Exeter? So I applied just to see. When I applied for a master's, um, and I got an unconditional offer for a PhD. So, okay, I'm not going for the PhD. I'm just only doing this master's thing because that's the only way my mom will actually let me go and do film. Because I was like, okay, mom, I did the politics. Can I now go do film? And I'll find a way to combine the two. No, you go do your master's. That way I am done with all my responsibility of having educated you to the best of my ability. Whatever you do with your life after that is up to you. That was a trick. She knew she would guilt trip me later um, and I would get sucked in. And that's exactly what happened. And so realizing that I realized, okay, if I want to do something to help the Palestinian cause, I actually need to be in some form of position of power. And I use the term power here very loosely. Um, and the only way I could do that is where I actually hold um, like a passport where I can, I, I am someone who can represent that country to be in a table. Um, where these decisions are made. And at the time that was only Sudan because I only carried the Sudanese passport at the time. And I started in Exeter at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies. And my idea was to see how I can help Palestine. In, and I see that flag behind you, Asha. And what, uh, what, yeah, yeah. And what I was met with in Exeter, how I was embraced in Exeter. I've been engaged in protests and, and organizing protests and everything in, in the US prior to coming to Exeter. But the kind of passion that the people of Exeter evoke in me is unparalleled. I, I, I have not seen it anywhere. I, I have met people who, who take pride in everything and it was so alien coming from the US. It was so alien to feel this passion because of the, it was something the US could not fully give me because passion is a matter of the soul and your soul cannot, cannot truly and holistically be introduced to passion um, because a human can never really feel co complete on stolen land, on a land that's, that spirit has been violated. And that's, that's been the US. And this is a realization that didn't come through until I went on a full circle in Exeter and then returned to the US. And that, that's when things started clicking from us. Oh, okay. But in the process of studying Arab politics, Middle East politics, policy studies in the Middle East and in the Arab world, and in studying Sudan for the very first time, beyond what my father is telling me, beyond, beyond what you know, we see the uncles and the aunts talk about, there was just a wealth, a, there's an abundance in Sudan and that was just one aspect of Africa. And I, I, I was stunned and just like, what am I doing? What is happening here? And there needs to be so much more digging. Um, and that's, that's what I did. I got digging. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, that's interesting, you know, because 
there's a common theme actually with our previous talk because we also had a discussion with Amanda precisely about this, this whole issue of, of different kinds of inheritances and also this issue of, of what does it mean to return to Africa or is it even called that or is it just kind of a natural next step, right? Um, so I, I, I certainly find it's interesting this whole question of, you know, from, from Arab to African. Um, because, you know, it's, it's like those sort of classic stereotypes that you have about Egypt and Sudan, except this kind of tension between the, you know, what NASA famously called the different circles, you know, of relationship and all that sort of stuff about North Africa and so forth. Um, but, but also, I think it's quite interesting because of the fact that on one hand, um, at the Institute, we don't really do Africa. Right? And Exeter doesn't really do Africa. And a lot of universities don't. So even when we're talking about, say, the Middle East or Asia, Africa, or the Muslim world, it's very rare that Africa even comes into that equation. Which is why the timing of this conversation is, is critical and is very significant and symbolic, I would say. I think 2020 as a whole, given that this is the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies that we're having this discussion, I think 2020 has been the world's Ramadan, if you think about it. It has been us forced to reckon within, forced to reflect. It has been connecting with our soul, checking our privilege, it's for Ramadan, you fast, um, you connect with, your, with, 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 with what feeds and nourishes your soul. You connect with what you have and, and relate it to what others don't have. You share what you have with what others don't have. There's so much of that in the spirit of Ramadan. And in so many ways, 2020 has been that to the world to check their privilege. It's in so many ways, I feel... 2020 is the universe telling the world, don't fear black, feel black. Feel what the black people have been going through. Feel what it means to be invisible. Feel what it means to be unable to connect with your family. Feel what it feels like to not see your child or your grandparent, or your neighbor. 2020 has, has shown us, and it's, I mean, I've said this so many times, that the quote of 2020 is, you're on mute. And that's, that's the story of people of African ancestry. We've been on mute. And the world is now forced to reckon with with this sentiment, with the, what, what do you mean you're muted? What does it mean that someone needs to tell you that you are muted and that after you've poured your heart out for a good three minutes and dropped some serious gems that have been you know, channeled from the ancestors <laughs> to you and somehow it, no one heard it. No one heard it because you're on mute. This is what 2020, um, is, is, is forcing us to reckon with, is, is, is pushing us to, to see all the different ways that we have been complacent in this system. We have been happily muting ourselves and just nodding away behind some blocked cameras while we're in our pajamas or, you know, stuffing our face with something and pretending to be engaged in a conversation we have no business in because we're not ready to take any action to fix anything that's being discussed. In, in, in every single way, we look at how Africa is being addressed you'll see that. You'll see that if you're pushing Africa in some way, there is a question, questioning your agenda. Why are you trying to look at Africa? Are you trying to bring out something we can use or are you doing it to stop us using something? 
And how you answer that determines whether or not you move forward. So for me saying, I, I came and I started this postgraduate degree as an Arab. Don't get me wrong, in my graduation, I still had the, the Arab flags hanging um, off my back uh, as I crossed the stage. And it was, it was the epitome of naivete. Um, it was uh, back when I was doing, I should say, um, <laughs> when I started studying um, and pursuing this postgrad, when I decided I'm actually going to go through with the PhD, it was the, again, I say in the naivete of thinking, I will be the first female president of Sudan. That ship has so long sailed because that's not the problem. The problem isn't that Sudan has or doesn't have a female leader. And it was an even bigger realization that nothing actually happens in these mediums. Politics, and this is why I say when I was reflecting on you know, the points I want to share with people, with Exonians specifically, um, it reaffirmed that there are no coincidences and that the person approaching me to have this talk in Exeter actually turned out to be the person who gave me the biggest lesson. And you, you have no idea, Sajjad, but it was you. You, let me say how, and I'm, I'm gonna try and be, what, what's the word? Mm, without, without giving too many details, but in an interaction with you, I'll, I was organizing one of the many, many events that I tried organizing and pulled off in the Institute, and I'm happy to talk about these later. Um, the seminars that we used to have in the Institute that were later followed by a dinner with the speakers. Um, there was a speaker there, and I think the people who were meant to be going on that dinner with the speaker either bailed or last minute changed, um, changed their plans. And you were tasked by taking the speaker and some people to dinner and you needed some students to fill in some seats. And so we were out at the coffee area in the cafe after the talk. He was like, so, so Jack comes up to me, he's like, so dinner? Granted, I'm a student and I always wanna be part of these conversations naturally. And I had a lot to share with that speaker who shall remain nameless um, <laughs> at the moment. And so I would have gladly said yes, but because I wasn't sure, because you know there wasn't that kind of engagement was suggested. I'd always just observed and knew everything that was happening in the in the institute from a distance. So I was very curious to see why Sajad was coming to me <laughs> to get me. So I just paused for a second, and his immediate response was like, "Didn't you need a letter written for the speaker you're getting?" And there. I realized right then and there, and it later got consolidated in my conclusion from my thesis, that you can get literally whatever you need done by finding or having what someone else needs more. That ended up being the ultimate conclusion of my PhD as well, of my doctoral thesis, because Sudan got away with any Sudan got and continues to get away with genocide in Darfur because it knows what the UAE needs and because the UAE knows what the US needs and because the US's hands are tied and is serving what Israel needs. And since what Israel needs is already with what with the UAE, Sudan can get away with whatever it needs. And that conclusion then just repeated itself to what's happening in Syria and Yemen, but we can get into that. But that moment when I realized, ah, yes, I can go to that dinner about that letter though. Now granted, he had probably already written that letter <laughs> and it was just a matter of just getting other things done because everything happens in the Institute at the same time. But that give and take, that understanding that what Ever you are studying and dissecting, be it politics, be it economics, be it religion, be it 
gender studies and transformation, you must take it down to the human level because ultimately those are the people moving these things. And if we try studying things in isolation of that human element, it will always be missing. It will always be lacking. And that is why Africa continues to be lacking and missing on the academic sphere of things. No one wants to face the African human. No one, want, no one can face a person of African ancestry without being consumed by shame. And we're not ready for that kind of pain. Humans are not ready for that kind of pain. So they will avoid it and they will look the other way and they will pretend like it's all okay and we're doing our part. This is why my bio says, I do everything I know how to do. Because despite graduating from a prestigious university like Exeter University, at the age of 25, I held my PhD at 25 and would still not get hired anywhere. It was because I was ringing a certain alarm. It was because I was looking for people to tell me that they acknowledge I have been robbed of everything. I have been robbed of my right to an identity. I have been robbed of my right to growth. I have been robbed of my right to history. I have been robbed of my right to fight to be recognized. And people are just, would rather be comfortable in their discomfort than take action. I think that's very true. And, and certainly um, that can easily be said. Um, I mean, Middle East studies, Islamic studies is, as you know, uh, despite um, what some people think is actually a very conservative field. Right, it's a very safe area. It's um, it's one which um, is in many ways so limited, right? Um, it's cool, but it is Sajad. It's a racist field. It's a colonized. It is, field. Of course, it's a colonized field, <laughs> yeah, and that's the it's kind of the process of decolonization, which I mean, Katie and I talked about it. We talked about it in the last session as well, yes. um, which it needs to be done. And uh, once you do that, then of course it has ripple effects on the. Um, the wider disciplines, whether it's the humanities or the social sciences, um, sort of generically as well. So I, I guess the question is, okay, so you come to this realization, um, you're I, I, wandering around trying to get a, a conventional job, I guess, a conventional job that a PhD um, would have, and then you realize that that's maybe not the way to do it. So, so what do you do next? Um spiraled into proper clinical depression for a bit, <laughs> um, especially when my uh, undergrad university called me and said, congratulations, it's been 10 years since you graduated. I was like, who wants to hear that? Why are you calling me to say it's been 10 years since I graduated? I don't have money for you. And even if I did, I will not give it to you just for that reminder. You have utterly failed me to be prepared for this world. Um, and and so I tried, I tried. So I did, I found this job where I literally felt like the job description was written for me. All it was missing was my name. It was for an organization called Bridges of Understanding. And it felt like just, you know, this great sexy cause, you know, building bridges of understanding between the US, the West and the Arab world and da 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 da. And I'm like, you know, we can play with that and then see how we can tune in and bring in Africa. And I was brought in as an executive director. And the first month passed and I realized I'm just doing the job of a glorified secretary. Now the founders of this organization, one of them was the, the former ambassador, former Jordanian ambassador to, to the US. And so you can imagine the kind of networking that comes with that. And then we sat for a strategic, I called for a strategic meeting. It's like, okay, I, I see the vision, but there's only one flagship project here that's happening, which is the youth talk connecting youth to, to one another from, from the Arab world to the US specifically. 
So I called for the strategic meeting and everything's put to the side. Like, let's focus on what's really important here. I said, great, what's really important? Every year we give an award, a Building Bridges Award. And this year, um, we need you to write the letter. Okay, who are we awarding? So I'm gonna put this out there, take a guess who they wanted me to write the letter for to award a Building Bridges Award between the US and the Arab world. Um, take a guess, and this is for everyone. I don't do lectures, so please unmute and go ahead and, and throw something out. Maybe not Veronica, because Veronica knows because I called her enraged. Uh, Anyone, if you were to gift, if you were to award someone the Building Bridges Award between the Arab world and the West, Adam, would you care to guess? Nah. Tony Blair, Tony Blair, they wanted me to write a letter to Tony Blair <laughs> to offer an award for Bill. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you must be joking. There is not one bridge left in Iraq, and you want to give him a building bridges award? Okay, yeah, this was controversy. We had we 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 thought you might you might you might think that. Okay, let let's throw another name out there. Who's the second name they suggest to a Sudanese? Hillary Clinton. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Yes, Jihad, that was my reaction. I almost fell off the chair. I was like, <laughs> and that was the same week that there was a viral picture of Hillary Clinton hugging Netanyahu. And it's like, okay, what message are we sending here? And that's when I realized there's, there's, not a, there's, not, there's not enough money in the world for me to be doing this. There's not enough energy in the world to be discussing with people who are putting something so blatantly wrong out there. Um, and yeah, fine, tried working with it because, you know, it's the system, I need food on the table and all of that, but it was, it just, it was not right. So that ended, as I said, went into my own spiral of depression. And then I realized I actually know how to do a lot of things. I, I've, I've done so many things when I was in Exeter that are outside. My, I mean, I've taught Arabic and I don't even speak Arabic very well. <laughs> I just, I did, like, shh, that's, don't tell people that. But there's so many things I know how to do. So I started doing everything I know how to do. I started helping my friends edit their, their chapters, their structure their PhDs, structure their proposals, transition from masters to PhDs, you know. And they started then recommending me to others. And so I started editing, I started advising, and then I started coaching because once they finished their PhD, how they transferred that to, to there. And then I said, okay. And then someone wanted to do something uh, like um, to organize a forum of some sort. I was like, oh, I, I have experience organizing conferences. And then, so I started organizing conferences and then forum and then strategic sessions. and. I literally started doing everything I know how to do. And it did not matter what the field was. So editing, I was editing everything from graphic designs to marketing to, um, you know, politics to religion, to, you name it. Um, and it just opened a world of knowledge. And all I had to do was connect some dots. And that's what I've been doing. I've been connecting dots after dots, after dots, after dots, until I came to, to a cross point and that cross point took me back again to Exeter, which is why I say Exeter really truly changed the trajectory of my life. Meeting Herman Bell my first year in Exeter, um, he was giving a talk called Paradise Lost on India. And I say this story so many times because it is important to emphasize how one encounter can change your life. Herman Bell came to me and started speaking in a language that sounded familiar, but I had no idea what he was saying. And it was Nubian. And he, he had this combination of rage and heartbreak. 
in his eyes when I told him I didn't understand what he said. He said, are you not Nubian? I said, no, of course I am. He's like, how dare you not speak your, your language? And that stayed with me that night. And I stayed up researching, trying to understand why this man from Virginia living in Oxford was so enraged that I don't speak my language. Um, and I started getting a glimpse of it that night. And as soon as the time was appropriate to call Egypt, I picked up the phone, no, to call the US. I picked up the phone and I called my father and I had the biggest fight with him. I was like, <laughs> how did you not teach me this language? How did you not teach me this heritage? How could you just use this language as a code between you and my uncles? And the reason I revisited that in 2016 was because the government of Sudan at the time had was moving forward with building three dams that were threatening to displace anywhere from 70 to 90,000 Nubians from their homes to submerge, depending on how you count a village, anywhere from 80 to 90 villages, to submerge more than 500 archeological sites that we know of. And that had to stop and it couldn't be stopped politically because if we started protests, there were already protests, there were already people out on the streets saying, don't build those dams. Those people were getting shot. Those people were getting killed. Those people were being buried and no one had any idea. It wasn't really for the international news because no one really cares about Africa. No one really cares about black people. So it needed to be done in a different way. It needed to be done from the angle that the world will care about. And the truth of the matter is the world cares about antiquities. They care about the rocks and the stones and the carvings of the wall that our ancestors have left behind, but not the descendants of these very ancestors that are paying the price as their legacy and their ancestors' legacy continues to be thwarted and violated over and over and over again. And that's how and why my sister and I started the Nubia Initiative to leverage what we know as far as academia, art and technology to protect, preserve and promote our endangered Nubian heritage, because the last generation to speak the Nubian language is my father's generation. Maybe some people from my generation can speak it, but if we're talking about a collective, yes, my father's generation. And that's a disaster because there's so much knowledge, so much knowledge that we have no access to because we can't decipher that language because both governments, Sudan and Egypt, have banned the teaching of that language. And that's not something that you'll hear about. That's not something that you can discuss academically. And if you do discuss it academically and, and really do point the finger as to why this is happening, you risk your academic career. You risk your research. You risk access to your source of knowledge. And I'm not just saying that I've witnessed that. I attended a conference, the International Conference on Nubian Studies in 2018 in September. And I've witnessed academics and scholars who were paid by the government to go to that conference to say that the Nubian civilization does not exist. And that it is in fact racist to use the word Nubian. Yes. And when a scholar, an Albanian scholar, Vincent, if you are watching this, more power to you, said, this is an academic setting. You can take your politics elsewhere. You can't come to the International Studies of Nubian Class, <laughs> to the International Conference of Nubian Studies to say Nubian studies don't exist. He was responded to with such confidence that he would no longer be welcome in Sudan. Say academia, is quickly turning into prostitution. That is something every single academic and every single emerging academic needs to take very seriously. Because if there is something that is going to choke or stop or restrict you bringing light to the truth as it is, that is not a field you want to be in regardless because it's going to ultimately eat at your soul. That's, that's what we're dealing with. This, this is why 
this is a global Black Lives Movement and this is why it is embodied in a revolution of consciousness because we really need to check ourselves when we say, what is actually happening here? I think um, I was just gonna make one small comment before I ask you what next. Um, I mean, this is kind of classic colonization of knowledge. So, you know, one of the ways it works is you kind of, um, you identify it, you um, historicize it, and what you try to do is you destroy it, right? Because it's easier to study something which is dead and which of which there are few vestiges than if it's something which is vibrant and in your face. Um, and, and we've seen this in many colonial contexts. And, and then of course, what happens is usually the post-colonial state continues those practices. Um, we, there's so many examples and of, um, I mean, I, I know a bit more about the British imperial context, but it, it happens in other imperial contexts as well, where you have this kind of willful destruction. And, and I guess the one thing which I, I, I was speaking to a friend the other day, realized that when it comes to things about traditions and culture, we're much, we're much happier with vesting objects and buildings with cultural traditions and the transmission of it, we're far less happy with individuals, right? We're not, we're not, we're not happy if humans say that they embody the culture and they want to transmit the culture and the tradition. Um, they don't want, we don't want that. We, we really just want it to be in, in inert, inanimate buildings and objects. Do you know why? Tell me, go ahead. Because if, if the human is if the human is communicating this culture, if the human is is actively breathing to life this culture as they communicate it to you, as they carry it to you, there is no control on how the receiver feels or what is moved in 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 the person receiving this energy that you that is that is coming out of you as a live being there is there are ways to control it out of an inanimate object there are ways to control what comes out of a carving on the wall and the ways to control that is to stop being able to decipher what is on the wall is to control who has access to that wall, which is why you have Egyptology and not Nubiology, which is why Egypt has ancient Egyptian culture and you have Nubians as little figurines or footnotes in the back, which is why people continue to get shot, shocked when you tell them, actually ancient Egyptians were black. It, it's like you are telling them the, you know, the world is a giraffe or something that just like makes, that cannot make sense to them. And, and you're, you're quite right in, in, you know, the post-colonial states continuing to appease the, but uh, well, of course, how else are they going to make sure that the colonials don't come back? They have to give them guarantees that you will always have access to what you had on this soil, just have that access from, from afar. You don't even need to come here. You just need to tell us what you need and we will give it to you. But just let us believe that we are free here. And that is what happened specifically to the Nubians. That is what happened. The Arabization of Nubia, the Arabization of Nubians is that we're not just responding to, to Western colonials and an imperialists. We are, we are responding to the Arab colonization that is too busy trying to prove that they are Western or too desperate trying to please and gain the blessings of the West, that we are subjected to two forms of colonization in one, perpetuating the self-inflicted state of mental slavery that continues to plague our people. And I'm speaking here specifically about Sudan and Egypt, because you have, in light of the, 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 the Sudan revolution, which continues to date, is that the youth, the martyrs, the brave heroes and heroes of my country that took to the street in December 2018 to say, we're no longer going to be painted by one brush. We're no longer just Arab, we're no longer just Muslim, we're no longer accepting your framing us as just one thing. Every single effort 
was mobilized to thwart that and that effort is strictly Arab because the second Sudanese recognized that actually we are African and not Arab, then the access of the Arabs to the riches of Sudan takes a completely different route, a completely different direction. Accountability comes to the table and the Arabs can no longer pay for our blood. Our blood becomes something of value that we recognize as such. But that's not what's happening now. What's happening now is that you had Egypt, which leveraged its position as chair of the African Union to change the African Union's decision, which said the military council has 15 days to transfer power from military to civilians for this revolution and for the people of Sudan. And Egypt walked in as the chair and said, nah, let's push that to 60 days. And in the meantime, let's smuggle the funds from the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia and the weapons that the US has already given to both these countries to pop up a military council led by a genocidal terrorist responsible for the massacre and the genocide and the murder of more than 300,000 Darfuris to appease the Arabs. And that's not something that we can even begin to discuss because you can't study Arab studies without studying racism. You will not understand Arab studies without understanding racism. And you will not understand racism until you understand misogyny because that's what made way to that. And that's a whole other story that I think would require a solid <laughs> series on its own. And there's definitely lots more to talk about and, and lots about the different projects, but I'm just aware of time. So what I will do is I will open it up if anyone has any questions or any comments, any, any follow-ups, clarifications, disagreements. Anyone? Um, May I? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for hosting this. And Dima, I appreciate your being hosted. Um, we, we, we've discussed briefly, the, you, you, you studied in the States, currently reside in the States, and you, you hold citizenship, in fact. And I suppose I approached you uh, during a recent conversation and inquired as to the extent to which you identify as, because, because I suppose there's, there's so much coverage currently of the black American experience. Not, 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 not African, not Arab, not, uh, there isn't, it isn't that refined, but there is the notion of the black experience and you were very quick to uh, distance yourself from that. Um, and I was sort of curious whether you might expand on what the, what the division is in terms of your personal identify, uh, in, in terms of your own personal identity. Yes. And and how you couldn't necessarily comment on the American Black experience. Yes, thank you for that, uh, Adam, and thank you for joining. Um, I can count on you to, to bring in these questions. It's very simple to say, I feel the struggle, or the struggle is real or I stand in solidarity. It's a completely different story to be genuine in understanding that there is no amount of affiliation and experience that will have me feel the grave injustice of Black America or that Black America continues to experience. I said earlier in the conversation that I have been robbed. I had been robbed of my history. I had been robbed of many things. But I know where I am from on the continent. I know where to trace my roots. I know where my ancestors are buried. 
I know where I can go and call upon them. I know where I can visit them. I know where I can learn. I know where I have land. That is not something, not just Black Americans, that is not something the extended diaspora of Africa has. That is something they have been not just robbed of, that is something they continue to be robbed of because even the facade of an attempt by the African Union to call on the diaspora by setting up the sixth region of the diaspora is nothing more but another attempt of the system to continue bringing in money and not people. And they can frame it however way they want to frame it. But if you look at it, if you follow the money, that's where that is. So for me to say, I can speak on behalf of a black American, I cannot. Yes, I am black. Yes, I hold a US citizenship. Yes, I am African. But to say I can identify with the pain, with the injustice, with the with the psychological warfare that has been waged on them like no other group of people. I mean, I was just listening to a debate yesterday of three brothers, three, three black men discussing moving forward um, after the elections. And I am sitting there and watching this black brother perpetuating points like black people abuse welfare and sure innocent black people that brother actually put quotes around innocent when he's talking about police brutalities and questioning that there are actually innocent people getting shot and the, the problem with that is that this, this this person actually believes what he is saying and I'm not, I, I can't hold against him what he believes, but I must question what kind of system, what kind of, of oppression was waged against this human to make him believe that his people actually deserve this kind of treatment from police. And it also goes back to what I said earlier about 2020 being this year where the world, where the universe is telling the world, don't fear black, feel black, feel what the black people have been going through. Feel being disassociated from your family, feel the disconnect. Black people everywhere in the world are my family and I have been disconnected from them as much as they have been disconnected from us. They have been told they no longer have a family. They have been told that they have been sold by their family on the continent. Just like us on the continent have been told that they were doing you any justice, those are the subhumans who are actually holding you back. this disconnect in family, this disassociation, this, this inability to understand that this is all one struggle. This is all one big, massive, I'm wary of not using words that will later have to have Sajjad edit, edit them, but man, it's, 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 it's <laughs> there are no words for it, except I must urge everyone to ask more questions. I must urge everyone to connect the dots. I must urge everyone to stop looking at our oppression as people of African ancestry, as isolation, in isolation or in silos and actually connect these dots and understand that there is a collective, continued, deliberate effort 
deliberate oppression of people of African ancestry and that once you connect these dots, you realize that it cannot be called anything but genocide as per international laws and charters. You go to the definition, you go to the four points that the UN will tell you constitute genocide and every single one of them has been executed ad nauseum targeting all people of African ancestry, every single way you slice it. And until that is recognized as such, we will continue to run around in circles and operate in silos. And this system will continue to grow and stand even stronger on our backs. And each and every person listening to this is responsible including myself. If we do not do something about it, if we do not ring that alarm and call it as it is, it is genocide. Are there any other questions or follow-ups on that? Um, I have one, but if anyone else has one. Can I, Sajid? Yes, please go ahead, Asha. Hi, um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's very, um, quite moving to listen to about what you mentioned, what you said about don't feel black, feel black, and the disconnect that people have from their families and 2020 being sort of a wake up call for a lot of people. And you spoke quite a bit on the global, the global disconnection, but um, I suppose my immediate um, reactions were on the micro um, um, level, you know, how people can now feel, how a Palestinian feels not being able to see their families, you know? Like I know a lot of people at the university having breakdowns, of course, clearly they love their families and they have great connections with them, but sometimes forgetting that black people as well as people of color also have families that they don't get to see on a daily basis based on a job you know, um, geopolitical reasons. Like I haven't seen my family in a really long time because I can't go back to see my family because my country is in state of civil war. Um, and I have other friends who are unable to go back see their families because they are Palestinians or they come from other parts of the world where it's a state of war or a state of colonization. Um, so I guess for me, the most moving part was hearing you actually verbalize um, that for some people, hopefully they'll be able to understand how we feel on a daily basis, how we are trying to keep up with them in terms of our work, like we are still in the same class with them. But yeah, we have to live with the pain of not being, a, not being able to talk to our family or not be able to see them for a really long time. And I guess people, um, become co um, complacent and also don't understand their complicity in the reasons why I can't see my family. You know, it's not, it's not the fault of me or my family, it's the fault of everyone that lives in the world, especially um, um, the ex-colonial powers of the reason why I can't go back to see my family. So I just, I just wanted to, um, sorry, I just wanted to um, appreciate your verbalization on, on what you said. Um, and I guess also the other comment was about the embodiment of culture. Um, made me think about, again, Palestinians. I have great love for Palestinians. Um, I remember growing up um, when bombs were going off and you know the war was happening. The first thought was for Palestinians. We didn't think about ourselves. We thought about Palestinian children being killed by someone else. So how the, the the, the Israeli um, um, system is unable to take the power away from Palestinians because they embody the culture of Palestine. They are living representative of what Palestine is. So unless they completely genocide the Palestinian people, the cause of Palestine will never end in the world. So I, I, I was wondering whether you can talk about the embodiment of culture and ideas within, within us rather than on an object that they can take away and control. Sorry, I, I rambled, I apologize. Sis, never be sorry. 
you will have nothing to be sorry as long as you're speaking your truth. And I thank you. I really appreciate you bringing this back to what I started with saying um, in terms of what Exeter has given me. I say this to all my friends, um, particularly those from Exeter, but I left a piece of me in Exeter. I left a part of me in Exeter and it's not to be, you know, romantic and, and emotional because you know people will tell you I'm an ice queen and this emotional stuff doesn't really work here in that sense but I left a piece of me in Exeter because I Exeter has unlocked so much passion and I, I needed to carry that passion with me and so I had to leave a part of me there that passion was part and parcel of realizing that wherever you are, you have every single thing you need to take you to the next step. Every single tool, every single emotion, every single bit of power to take you from what was my first 57 and I thought I was miserably failing in Exeter only to realize that actually that wasn't too bad because I was converting it to US grading system and that was traumatizing. Um, to graduating and you know, getting distinctions and being recommended for publication and all of that stuff. But every single challenge you stop at is the universe, is, is God telling you stop? Are you actually using every blessing I have given you? And anytime you feel or see or go back and look at when the Palestine cause or issue has taken a dip from the media, you can and will, I guarantee, relate and link it back to a sense of victimization. You will see that the Palestinians during that phase have entered the victim mode as opposed to we've been here and we continue to be here. This mentality of, of victimization is so crippling and we really truly don't understand the magnitude of the mind when it comes to that. The power of the mind when you say, I have family everywhere I go. I may be in Exeter. Exeter was my first time being entirely alone. Like, as I said earlier, my mother wouldn't have me go to the UK um, to study because she didn't want me to be alone because I was too young. Um, I mean, still young when I can. She might not think it. But um, I was alone and I was so surrounded by love because I chose to not be alone. You have that option. And when I say, I'll give this example and I hope you, you will join us in Africa Week 2020, which is a platform. It's, a, it's an Afrocentric solution-based platform where we held a virtual family reunion of all people of African ancestry, wherever we are in the world, right? We called out on all our family, anything you want to share with us, anything you want to teach us, anything you want to learn about, anything you want to talk about, anything you want to sing or dance or harp or rant or yell about, come to that platform and let's do it together. And it started off as part of marking the Africa Liberation Day on the 25th of May. And that day was too little to take everything we are because all things Africa rising is just pure abundance. So we had to expand it, let's say three days, and then it was still too little, and then another one. So we ended up having six days of continuous non-stop live streaming on all things Africa rising from African spirituality to alternative medicine to yoga to connecting with your ancestors to research career advancement to technology and agribusiness and agriculture you name it to cooking classes to dance to drumming and la bomba revolution you name it 
we had people tuning in from Japan, from Philippines, from Puerto Rico, from Nigeria, from Kenya. We are everywhere. So the second you feel you, you're alone and you don't, you don't have your family, and I understand not being immediately close to your family, but understand that you have family. You have family everywhere, wherever you are. And even if you don't know them, they are sending you, I have been sending you love. I don't even know you and I'm just, I'm just meeting you now, but I have been sending you love, believe, believe and I'm not the only one. What you need to do as far as embodying that culture, embodying that heritage, embodying who we are as people of African ancestry is wake up. And as our Cape Verdean brother Raiz said to kick us off for the Global Day of Action for Black Power, which was just the 22nd of November, there is no guide to waking you up. There is no guide. I can try and wake you up. I can try and ring that alarm. But literally, all you need to do is wake up. And when you do, you hold that mirror, you go and see that mirror and tell yourself, we are Africa rising. You are the embodiment of this rising continent. You and everyone believes that it is time. I hope that helps. No. No, definitely. Thank you. Um, yes, yes. I have, I have, like, just to clarify, I have so much love in Exeter. I have people who, like, in every corner of Exeter, like, I don't, I don't, I don't feel alone in that way at all. But, um, but misses my family, you know? And yes. not understanding that, that is sometimes hard and constantly having to explain that aspect. But to so don't give them that option. Don't yeah. give them that option. Speak about who you are. Speak about your village. Speak about your traditions. Hold meetings, hold coffees, hold teas, make your bunna, make your favorite dish, wear your traditional attire. I swear to, listen, when the Arab tsunami, and I don't call it a spring because there's not one flower that came out of it, even Tunis that we helped was going to, but is now shutting down. Let's say, when that was happening, I, those 18 days were critical because that's when I was meant to be submitting my thesis and I stopped everything. It was a complete state of paralysis. I went to the high street, I held a piece of uh, a board where I plastered the express and echo on it and I wrote, I want to be with my people. I had a bucket there because I had 25 pounds in my account and my mother would not send me money because when I said, mom, I don't have money to eat, I know. But if I send you anything, you're gonna book a ticket and you're gonna go to the Hayyib Square. So you're gonna sit there and find someone to help you with something until this is all over. And I stood on the street to remind people, yeah, I'm here and I'm far away from who I grew up with and who I call my people and I, I, my soul right there to sit there and pretend like it's okay you're going to recognize that i am here and that i am in pain and you're going to do part of that when you miss home be home bring out your bukhur. bring out traditional attire wallahi go out to the high street wallahi, and do, do it you have no idea wallahi i do i do that <laughs> every <laughs> single night <laughs> that happens. my bakur my bone my traditional clothes my my anjara my, my, my sore everything happens and everyone knows so keep like, doing it keep doing it keep doing it and keep calling on our people to reach out and feel you thank you Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Jihad has something to say. Jihad, go ahead. You're muted. <laughs> Jihad, you're muted. Okay, sorry, and I'm bouncing on my yoga ball. <laughs> sorry. It's, it's a pl thank you, uh, Sijad. It means a lot. And thank you, Dima. It's always a pleasure to hear you speaking. It's always a treasure, really. 
regarding our Sudan, I'm always been thinking uh, this amazing. I mean, I'm fascinated that there are some Nubians, they're still with this hyper Arab nationalism, hyper form of Arab nationalism to, to the point of extreme racism. And it's amazing to me. You have people from the Dongola tribe, Alfawians, who I'm also from, and we're the troublemakers. I mean, that's what we're known for in Sudan, the trouble bureaucrats. And an uncle who was involved in the coup attempt. That, that tells you something there. So, and then you have uh, from other Nubian tribes, they all identify with some form of Arab nationalism to the extreme of disregarding the African identity. And it is, the, I mean, I looked at it from personal experience, like, why are you ashamed of your African identity? I mean, why are you ashamed of uh, being African? I mean, it's, it's a symbol of pride. I mean, I always said to them, it's like a symbol of pride. Or as Dr. John Gellin always said, and I know we have a little bit of disagreements there. He said, we're neither Africans or neither Arabs. We're Sudanese. We're exceptional. But, but I'm always wondering. I can see the nodding already. So I, I'm sure it's going to be coming on Monday. <laughs> so I'm always wondering, is there a form of way to communicate the idea that they can also be proud of their African identity. I mean, they don't have, you know, what's wrong with being proud of Africa? I mean, is there a way to cement that idea through awareness campaigns? I mean, especially with the old thinking they still have of being Arabs, Arabs all the time. Although the Arabs, we don't care that much for them. That's not even on its own matter. Are you familiar with the experiment of those rats where they, you know, there's a sound that's played and then that rat is beaten. Yes. Then a sound is played and then they're beaten. And then the sound is played and then they're beaten. And okay. after enough times, the sound is beat and they don't need to be beaten because the rat mm -hmm. freaks out on its own. Okay. This is the state <laughs> of not just Nubians. This is mm -hmm. the state of every single person of African ancestry who is unable to connect to the ultimate truth that your root is on the continent. That, that, that okay. is it, that is it. You, are, you, are, you have been conditioned that all that comes out of this continent is lacking, diseased, or war-torn. And if you are in any way affiliated to that, then you too are lacking, diseased, and or war-torn. And in a world that is telling you about being holistic and being complete and thriving in your own space, that is only being framed in your escape or disassociation from that which you are. Mm -hmm. there, there, there is a, a, a schizophrenic approach to telling you to identify with self away from self. Absolutely. Yes. So when, when you talk about the Sudanese, and I say beyond just Nubians, when the youth of Sudan went out and said, Kul al -balad darfur, we are all Darfur. Yes, yes, yes. And then George Floyd gets lynched and murdered. And then you have Sudanese parents telling you, Man, that just, mm, that's, you know, not our circus, not our monkeys, you know? Or, what do you mean Black Lives Matter? We're not Black. Can yeah, I? I, <laughs> yeah, I can see it now. It's quite odd and disturbing. You, you know what I mean? So it, it goes beyond, beyond Nubians. We, we are talking about an entire people who have been told if you want to thrive, you need to leave behind all that is you. You cannot identify mm -hmm. with who you are because you come from lacking. That's true. You know, and, and if you're being told that in your identification of being black, you are racist or you're a thug or you are incapable or you are poor, or you are any other adjective you want to use that puts you in a box. Mm. 
how and why would you feel inclined to reclaim that? How and why would you say, actually, hang on, that's, that's not who I am. I come from mm -hmm. this, I come from that, I come from that. We have been collectively conditioned to believe that black history starts with slavery. Yes. Any attempt uh, of any attempt to to share or to dive or to question what was before slavery is distorted, mm -hmm. is severely restricted. If you dare mm -hmm. have it in in a uh, in a, an academic context, you are questioned and questioned and questioned again. That's if you find the funding to do it in the first place, because no one wants to fund you finding the truth that you and your ancestors are the reason there is anything worth having on this planet <laughs> because that you part, yeah. taking it all back because they are doing it from an angle of projection the reason we mm. as people of african ancestry have been accepting this 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 lacking scenario is because it's been projected at us because the colonizers came to the continent to the continent with a lacking perspective they were coming to get what they were lacking out there. And mm -hmm. they projected this lacking. We internalized that. And, you know, we are masters of what we put our hands on. And that was the <laughs> one thing we put our hands on. We put our hands on that and took it and ran. And we've been running since. And now when mm -hmm. we're trying to wake up, when we're trying to ring that alarm, us standing up is literally shaking the grounds from under the feet of, of those standing on our backs. They can't have it. As soon as they feel even the neck go up before the rest of the back stands up, they need to break that back. Mm. That's your point. How to do it is to keep being that embodiment. For me personally, I am always wearing something that shows where I am from. You cannot take or disassociate me from the continent. I am either carrying it here or carrying it here or firing it out through here. There is no way you can escape my being African. I am in your space and you will not find a way around it. Of course, yes. That's your point. Thank you. Thank you, Dima. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dima. You know, to be honest, uh, we could, as I said, be going on for hours and hours, but I, I just feel that we could um, draw this to a close. And maybe we can, um, actually, maybe we can do a future event which is much more focused on the kind of strategies of how we do some of these things. Um, because uh, we've also, of course, I mean, Katie's aware of this, we've We've talked a lot in the university about how we actually do training properly um, uh, on questions of equality and also on, on anti-racism. So maybe we can call on you again um, to do something can further. Just, but... Can I just say one thing? Yes, very please quick. go ahead. Yeah, very quick. Good evening. Um, I'm, I'm here in Roma, so I'm linked in Roma. Thank you, Dima. It was so real, so autobiographical, so true and so inspirational that it's very important to listen your words. Having said that, um, I'm just say one sentence. Uh, you said that 2020, it's, um, it's mute. So every country is suffering, every country is in self-reflection. But unfortunately, every country, I'm speaking especially about Italy, is in self-reflection in terms of, oh, we can't see our family, we can't see our relatives we can't see they don't connect mentally globally so i would like to invite you to roma in italy and speak out because we need this connection to be to embrace the world not just the state may i respond if we have time yes go ahead, go ahead. Words. Thank, yes, go ahead. You. thank you uh vero just a quick correction i didn't say every country i don't i don't deal with countries or governments or institutions human to human every human is forced to reckon every human has found themselves in the position that this is something they need to reflect with 
With the revolution in Sudan, um, at the heart of the revolution in Sudan, because as I said, it continues. But last year, at the heart of it, um, as you know, I was sitting outside the embassy of Sudan and I was sat there in Washington, D.C. from April, from when the sit-in began in Sudan until the signing of the Fassad Agreement in August. And since then, I continue to go back every Saturday I can to write and color their pavements and tell them that the revolution continues and that we are not buying into their lies. Um, that the Emirates, that the united axis of evil continues to be pouring into. And I had a French reporter come to me and um, say, what do you expect from the government? What do you expect from the US administration? And my response was, I expect the US government to listen to the US people. I expect every government to listen to its people. I'm not here to take the attention of the government or to bring any government to listen to what I have to say. I am done with governments. I am done with countries. I deal with people. This is a people to people revolution. It was the people in Kenya who got up and carried our flags to their Supreme Court to say what's happening in Sudan. It was the people in Ghana who carried our flags and marched to the presidential palace to say what is the African Union doing in our name to help our brother's sister in Sudan. It was the people in Algeria who carried out flags, the people in Southern Cameroon, while they're being oppressed and in case of genocide, by the way, if you don't know about what's happening in Cameroon, check out the following hashtags. I will write them down. End the Anglophone crisis. Congo is bleeding. End SARS. Shut it all down, Namibia. Guinea votes, Tanzania decides 2020, all these hashtags have one thing in common, is that the misleaders on the continent will have you believe that all is nice and well. Our struggle continues to be one and it continues to be a struggle of the people. I was not talking about any country because the country is only interested in one thing, how the person, the person in power stays in power. So even they operate on the basis of people. It's just a different kind of people. Um, we do have a comment from the live stream. <laughs> if I can uh, read it, Joey, Zaza, I don't know if you're still watching, but we all leave a piece of ourselves back home, whatever it may be, when we are forced to leave for whatever reason. Necessity is the mother of invention. And the whole in our being is an opportunity to live a higher purpose. Salute to all. Best way to wake someone up is to wake up yourself and make as much noise as possible. So when you make that coffee, don't set the place on fire, but make sure the aroma goes everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. That's a, that's a good point to end at. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Brilliant. Yeah, Stay safe. <laughs> um, thank you once again, uh, Dima, and thank you for all those who have joined us. Um, we will, of course, be putting the recording up on our YouTube channel. And uh, as I said, I really hope we can do further events with you and, of course, with others on the same kinds of topics. Um, uh, you know, one thing we, we did deliberately decide is that we didn't just want to do the anti-racism event in Black History Month. But in a sense, it had to continue because, of course, it doesn't make sense to confine Black history to one month anyway, um, as everyone sort of says so. But unfortunately, it's the classic thing that we all pay, pay lip service to these things, but don't necessarily carry it out. But I, I certainly hope that at the Institute, we will start changing the way we do things uh, and uh, take things in a, a much more uh, positive direction. So thank you once again. Thank you for everyone who's listened and thank you to Katie for setting up um, the, um, the session. And uh, I guess we will keep you posted on our next events. For those of you who are in Exeter, you'll know that we have our, our book club tomorrow. No, no, is it tomorrow? What day is it today? Wednesday? Friday. Yeah, Friday. It's on Friday, yeah. So we've got our, our book club on Friday, the Anti-Racism Book Club. So please do kind of join in on that as well. So thank you thank once again. You. Thank you so very much for your time, for your energy, for this, and do call on me. I am here for it all. Cool.
Thank you once again. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.